Esta exposição partiu de um desafio que foi lançado pela Casa da Arquitetura depois de ter recebido o acervo de João Luís Carrinho da Graça. A intenção aqui é, naturalmente, a de mostrar o acervo, mas também a de revelar a obra e a personagem de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. Eu penso que o principal desafio deste espaço é, efetivamente, a dimensão, a escala do espaço. Foi isso que acabou por nos parecer que era o mais interessante. Portanto, é haver uma primeira relação com este espaço, que é de entrar e ter uma leitura global da exposição e depois ter um percurso lento que nos permite ir vendo aquilo que está a ser mostrado. Escolheram-se, então, três projetos. Portanto, acabam por haver uma série de de desenhos, algumas fotografias, uma série de filmes foram uh, realizados especificamente para este fim, pela Catarina Mourão, André Cepedo, Tiago Casanova, etc. Portanto, essa relação entre texto, vídeo e a palavra é, no fundo, aquilo que introduz as pessoas uh, no universo de cada um dos projetos. Eu sempre gostei imenso de maquetes e de uh, e maquetes, quer quando estou a dar aulas, quer no ateliê para, para trabalhar. Percebe-se então que estão aqui maquetes de enormes dimensões, ou seja, quando nós imaginamos que estas maquetes não estavam originalmente numa nave destas dimensões, mas estavam num ateliê de arquitetura, quase que custa a querer uh, que não ocupassem a totalidade do ateliê. Vão então sendo acompanhados por uma série de elementos que vão ajudando a perceber este processo de projeto. Para dar apenas uh, dois exemplos, se calhar referiria, por exemplo, um desenho de Saverio Muratori, mas também os arquitetones uh, que pertencem ao Centro Jorge Pompidou e que foram bastante importantes, sobretudo no início da sua carreira. A exposição Flashback de João Luís Carrilho da Graça vem mostrar o que são 40 anos de produção da sua arquitetura e conseguimos entender a forma como este arquiteto produz a arquitetura. A exposição e o programa de atividades que a acompanham vêm cumprir este desígnio da casa de mostrar a arquitetura a partir dos acervos da arquitetura e, neste caso, a obra de João Luís Carrilho da Graça.
outro dia tive uma, assim, uma espécie de troca de ideias sobre o facto da arquitetura ser ou não uma arte. Eu defendo que não é. A arquitetura existe para resolver, poderíamos dizer, problemas ou programas. Nós aceitamos e precisamos de programas e da interação e da necessidade, senão não, não construímos. Estamos sempre a construir com outras pessoas. Esta exposição partiu de um desafio que foi lançado pela Casa da Arquitetura depois de ter recebido o acervo de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. A intenção aqui é, naturalmente, a de mostrar o acervo, mas também a de revelar a obra e a personagem de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. Eu penso que o principal desafio deste espaço é, efetivamente, a dimensão, não é? a escala do espaço. E foi isso que acabou por nos parecer que era o mais interessante. Portanto, é haver uma primeira relação com este espaço, que é de entrar e ter uma leitura global da exposição e depois ter um percurso lento que nos permite ir vendo aquilo que está a ser mostrado. Escolheram-se então 10 projetos, portanto, acaba por haver uma série de, de desenhos, algumas fotografias, uma série de filmes foram realizados especificamente para este fim, pela Catarina Mourão, André Cepedo, Tiago Casanova, etc. Portanto, essa relação entre texto, vídeo, e a palavra é, no fundo, aquilo que introduz as pessoas uh, no universo de cada um dos projetos. Eu sempre gostei imenso de maquetes e de uh, e maquetes, quer quando estou a dar aulas, quer no ateliê para, para trabalhar. Percebe-se então que estão aqui maquetes de enormes dimensões, ou seja, quando nós imaginamos que estas maquetes não estavam originalmente numa nave destas dimensões, mas estavam num ateliê de arquitetura, quase que custa a crer uh, que não ocupassem a totalidade do ateliê. Vão então sendo acompanhados por uma série de elementos que vão ajudando a perceber este processo de projeto. Para dar apenas uh, dois exemplos, se calhar referiria, por exemplo, um desenho de Saverio Muratori, mas também uns arquitetones uh, que pertencem ao Centro Jorge Pompidou e que foram bastante importantes, sobretudo no início da sua carreira. A exposição Flashback de João Luís Carrilho da Graça veio mostrar o que são 40 anos de produção da sua arquitetura e conseguimos entender a forma como este arquiteto produz a arquitetura. A exposição e o programa de atividades que a acompanham vêm cumprir este desígnio da casa de mostrar a arquitetura a partir dos acervos de arquitetura e, neste caso, a obra de João Luís Carrilho da Graça.
No outro dia tive uma, assim, uma espécie de troca de ideias sobre o facto da arquitetura ser ou não uma arte. Eu defendo que não é. A arquitetura existe para resolver, poderíamos dizer, problemas ou programas. Nós aceitamos e precisamos de programas e da interação e da necessidade, senão não, não construímos. Estamos sempre a construir com outras pessoas. Esta exposição partiu de um desafio que foi lançado pela Casa da Arquitetura depois de ter recebido o acervo de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. A intenção aqui é, naturalmente, a de mostrar o acervo, mas também a de revelar a obra e a personagem de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. Eu penso que o principal desafio deste espaço é, efetivamente, a dimensão, a escala do espaço. Foi isso que acabou por nos parecer que era o mais interessante. Portanto, é haver uma primeira relação com este espaço, que é de entrar e ter uma leitura global da exposição e depois ter um percurso lento que nos permite ir vendo aquilo que está a ser mostrado. Escolheram-se então 10 projetos, portanto, acabam por haver uma série de, de desenhos, algumas fotografias, uma série de filmes foram realizados especificamente para este fim, pela Catarina Mourão, André Cepedo, Tiago Casanova, etc. Portanto, essa relação entre texto, vídeo e a palavra é, no fundo, aquilo que introduz as pessoas uh, no universo de cada um dos projetos. Eu sempre gostei imenso de maquetes e de pedir uh, maquetes, quer quando estou a dar aulas, quer no ateliê para, para trabalhar. Percebe-se então que estão aqui maquetes de enormes dimensões, ou seja, quando nós imaginamos que estas maquetes não estavam originalmente numa nave destas dimensões, mas estavam num ateliê de arquitetura, quase que custa a crer uh, que não ocupassem a totalidade do ateliê. Vão então sendo acompanhados por uma série de elementos que vão ajudando a perceber este processo de projeto. Para dar apenas uh, dois exemplos, se calhar referiria, por exemplo, um desenho de Saverio Muratori, mas também uns arquitetones uh, que pertencem ao Centro Jorge Pompidou e que foram bastante importantes, sobretudo no início da sua carreira. A exposição Flashback de João Luís Carrilho da Graça veio mostrar o que são 40 anos de produção da sua arquitetura e conseguimos entender a forma como este arquiteto produz a arquitetura. A exposição e o programa de atividades que a acompanham vêm cumprir este desígnio da casa de mostrar a arquitetura a partir dos acervos da arquitetura e, neste caso, a obra de João Luís Carrilho da Graça.
No outro dia tive uma, assim, uma espécie de troca de ideias sobre o facto da arquitetura ser ou não uma arte. Eu defendo que não é. A arquitetura existe para resolver, poderíamos dizer, problemas ou programas. Nós aceitamos e precisamos de programas e da interação e da necessidade, senão não, não construímos. Estamos sempre a construir para outras pessoas. Esta exposição partiu de um desafio que foi lançado pela Casa da Arquitetura depois de ter recebido o acervo de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. A intenção aqui é, naturalmente, a de mostrar o acervo, mas também a de revelar a obra e a personagem de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. Eu penso que o principal desafio deste espaço é, efetivamente, a dimensão, a escala do espaço. Foi isso que acabou por nos parecer que era o mais interessante. Portanto, é haver uma primeira relação com este espaço, que é de entrar e ter uma leitura global da exposição e depois ter um percurso lento que nos permite ir vendo aquilo que está a ser mostrado. Escolheram-se então 10 projetos, portanto, acabam por haver uma série de, de desenhos, algumas fotografias, uma série de filmes foram realizados especificamente para este fim, pela Catarina Mourão, André Cepedo, Tiago Casanova, etc. Portanto, essa relação entre texto, vídeo, e a palavra é, no fundo, aquilo que introduz as pessoas uh, no universo de cada um dos projetos. Eu sempre gostei imenso de maquetes e de uh, e maquetes, quer quando estou a dar aulas, quer no ateliê para, para trabalhar. Percebe-se então que estão aqui maquetes de enormes dimensões, ou seja, quando nós imaginamos que estas maquetes não estavam originalmente numa nave destas dimensões, mas estavam num ateliê de arquitetura, quase que custa a crer uh, que não ocupassem a totalidade do ateliê. Vão então sendo acompanhados por uma série de elementos que vão ajudando a perceber este processo de projeto. Para dar apenas uh, dois exemplos, se calhar referiria, por exemplo, um desenho de Saverio Muratori, mas também os arquitetones uh, que pertencem ao Centro Jorge Pompidou e que foram bastante importantes, sobretudo no início da sua carreira. A exposição Flashback de João Luís Carrilho da Graça veio mostrar o que são 40 anos de produção da sua arquitetura e conseguimos entender a forma como este arquiteto produz a arquitetura. A exposição e o programa de atividades que a acompanham vêm cumprir este desígnio da casa de mostrar a arquitetura a partir dos acervos da arquitetura e, neste caso, a obra de João Luís Carrilho da Graça.
outro dia tive uma, assim, uma espécie de troca de ideias sobre o facto da arquitetura ser ou não uma arte. Eu defendo que não é. A arquitetura existe para resolver, poderíamos dizer, problemas ou programas. Nós aceitamos e precisamos de programas e da interação e da necessidade, senão não, não construímos. Estamos sempre a construir para outras pessoas. Esta exposição partiu de um desafio que foi lançado pela Casa da Arquitetura depois de ter recebido o acervo de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. A intenção aqui é, naturalmente, a de mostrar o acervo, mas também a de revelar a obra e a personagem de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. Bem, eu penso que o principal desafio deste espaço é, efetivamente, a dimensão, não é? a escala do espaço. E foi isso que acabou por nos parecer que era o mais interessante. Portanto, é haver uma primeira relação com este espaço, que é de entrar e ter uma leitura global da exposição e depois ter um percurso lento que nos permite ir vendo aquilo que está a ser mostrado. Escolheram-se então 10 projetos, portanto, acabam por haver uma série de, de desenhos, algumas fotografias, uma série de filmes foram realizados especificamente para este fim, pela Catarina Mourão, André Cepedo, Tiago Casanova, etc. Portanto, essa relação entre texto, vídeo, e a palavra é, no fundo, aquilo que introduz as pessoas uh, no universo de cada um dos projetos. Eu sempre gostei imenso de maquetes e de uh, e maquetes, quer quando estou a dar aulas, quer no ateliê para, para trabalhar. Percebe-se então que estão aqui maquetes de enormes dimensões, ou seja, quando nós imaginamos que estas maquetes não estavam originalmente numa nave destas dimensões, mas estavam num ateliê de arquitetura, quase que custa a crer uh, que não ocupassem a totalidade do ateliê. Vão então sendo acompanhados por uma série de elementos que vão ajudando a perceber este processo de projeto. Para dar apenas uh, dois exemplos, se calhar referiria, por exemplo, um desenho de Saverio Muratori, mas também os arquitetones uh, que pertencem ao Centro Jorge Pompidou e que foram bastante importantes, sobretudo no início da sua carreira. A exposição Flashback de João Luís Carrilho da Graça veio mostrar o que são 40 anos uh, de produção da sua arquitetura e conseguimos uh, entender a forma como este arquiteto produz a arquitetura. A exposição e o programa de atividades que a acompanham vêm cumprir este desígnio da casa de mostrar a arquitetura a partir dos acervos da arquitetura e, neste caso, a obra de João Luís Carrilho da Graça.
outro dia tive uma, assim, uma espécie de troca de ideias sobre o facto da arquitetura ser ou não uma arte. Eu defendo que não é. A arquitetura existe para resolver, poderíamos dizer, problemas ou programas. Nós aceitamos e precisamos de programas e da interação e da necessidade, senão não, não construímos. Estamos sempre a construir com outras pessoas. Esta exposição partiu de um desafio que foi lançado pela Casa da Arquitetura depois de ter recebido o acervo de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. A intenção aqui é, naturalmente, a de mostrar o acervo, mas também a de revelar a obra e a personagem de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. Eu penso que o principal desafio deste espaço é, efetivamente, a dimensão, não é? a escala do espaço. E foi isso que acabou por nos parecer que era o mais interessante. Portanto, é haver uma primeira relação com este espaço, que é de entrar e ter uma leitura global da exposição e depois ter um percurso lento que nos permite ir vendo aquilo que está a ser mostrado. Escolheram-se então 10 projetos, portanto, acabam por haver uma série de, de desenhos, algumas fotografias, uma série de filmes foram realizados especificamente para este fim, pela Catarina Mourão, André Cepedo, Tiago Casanova, etc. Portanto, essa relação entre texto, vídeo, e a palavra é, no fundo, aquilo que introduz as pessoas uh, no universo de cada um dos projetos. Eu sempre gostei imenso de maquetes e de uh, e maquetes, quer quando estou a dar aulas, quer no ateliê para, para trabalhar. Percebe-se então que estão aqui maquetes de enormes dimensões, ou seja, quando nós imaginamos que estas maquetes não estavam originalmente numa nave destas dimensões, mas estavam num ateliê de arquitetura, quase que custa a crer uh, que não ocupassem a totalidade do ateliê. Vão então sendo acompanhados por uma série de elementos que vão ajudando a perceber este processo de projeto. Para dar apenas uh, dois exemplos, se calhar referiria, por exemplo, um desenho de Saverio Muratori, mas também os arquitetones uh, que pertencem ao Centro Jorge Pompidou e que foram bastante importantes, sobretudo no início da sua carreira. A exposição Flashback de João Luís Carrilho da Graça veio mostrar o que são 40 anos de produção
Good afternoon and welcome. This is an afternoon riddled with surprises that we'll have at Casa d'Architettura, including in the uh, program of the flashback exhibition Carrillo da Graça. I would like to greet Guillermo and Marta, who will present this uh, beautiful TC on João Luis Rio de Raja from 95 to 2022. And I would like to congratulate Guillermo for this uh, uh, publication. I was reading it. It was a brilliant work. We know how hard it is. And also to João Luis, who is seen here in this publication with his works which are actually magnificent and that talk a lot about the condition of architecture itself. Some of these works and the curator Marta Skeira establishes a connecting point between the exhibition here at Casa da Arquitetura and also these Tizia Quadernos some of them are part of the exhibition, so we can see differently. There is a graphic record that we are very proud of in this market of architecture. So congratulations, Guillermo, once again. Let me greet Delfil Sardin, Jean-Luc Cohen, Jean Cohen, because the duration of Marta will follow in a debate, a conversation, a presentation, including in this program. And then Marta Skater will deepen this presentation and to say that you are very honored with your inspiration. And for all of those who follow us online, telling you that uh, this exhibition on the work of Jean-Louis has been very successful in the attraction, in the curiosities that has been brought forward in universities that are coming to watch the exhibition. All of them have mentioned as the brilliant exhibition that it is, not just because of the architecture that comes about in the exhibition, but also the design of João Luiz Nes Lobo and the designer made a brilliant work in Casa da Arquitetura feels very honored also to the curator congratulations once again that has brought a great interest not just from the national audience but also foreign people who have been seeing the exhibition in the work in the way that's so careful that they think that they leave this um, exhibition a lot more um, enlightened about the work of João Luis Carrillo de Graça and soon with a digital building they will be able to analyze all the work via his collection that is in the digital building for the access of all throughout the world. It is something that we do in a continuous mm, construction of the archive that will help to build this digital archive. Many models, many designs, many works. And also In terms of a vision of the future, we can visit with the circuit of architecture that CASA is preparing at the Tourism of Portugal in order to bring not just, not just the collection in CASA de Arquitetura, but also exhibitions and the works itself can be open and visited by all. So when we visit architecture exhibitions, we don't see architecture 
as we find a work of art at an exhibition of uh, plastic arts, for example, when we visit it, we see the representations of said architecture, representation of the designs of authors, of the process, of the graphic definition, of all that is the architecture, and also of pictures, of models, that help to understand or to build the project reaching the final construction of those who can do it because there is around 70 percent of the work of each architect doesn't see the light of day so it's very important when we see this retrospective on the work of the architect we understand that there are some works represented differently because they are finished there is also the picture of the work of the afterwork the magnificent pictures that we see here but there is a set of elements of projects that were never built and it is by exploring the projects in terms of the digital or physical that we can understand that the architect's work is very cross-sectional and it goes beyond what we are able to realize in publications and exhibitions. And this work that CASA is doing with the Tourism of Portugal has the intention of opening this possibility of people to experience architecture and to bring architecture into their everyday reality. On behalf of Casa da Arquitetura, let me thank you all and let me thank uh, TC and Guilherme to keep publishing like this, to João Luís to not to, to increase his archive of Arquitetura, but also to continue to build Portugal and in Europe and throughout the world, wishing you all to Delfim Sardin, the curator Marta, a brilliant afternoon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't speak Portuguese, so I will I will speak I will speak, make my presentation in Spanish. First thanks to Casa L'Arquitetura for allowing us to come to this event in terms of the exhibition of Flashback in Rio de Graça. And also thanks to Marta Skate and Luis for all the support in the process. So today we are presenting this uh, one, 154, 155 dedicated to Carril de Graça. And this is a figure that has a selection of 18 works built between 1995 and 2022. It is a very important part of the trajectory of Carrillo de Graça. So, I think that the task of the editor needs to be invisible in the sense that we talk in the sense of coordinating and get surrounded by people who are aware who know more so in that sense it is as an important part and i would like to thank marta skater for all the collab cooperation in the introduction of the monography and also for being here as the as a publisher i would like to share this part of the publishing process because it's a very important part which is well the selection of what there is a part that it's controversial on the other everyone gives an opinion but it's something that we enjoy this image in the measure that it represents five parts 
that were on the cover from an objectivity of the editor which is a way to show different ways of understanding or to share an idea of all the richness of uh, Le Carrillo de Graça's architecture. And so this editorial objectivity ends up having a lot of subjectivity of the architect, of a sensitivity, which is the one on the cover that we have. In a weight, the, num the, the name of Carrillo de Graça is an honor. And it, there's a very important moment in the trajectory of the editorial. It is a process that took a lot of time. So we are very happy to be presenting this number. And also I'd like to think, and I would like to convey that for you, this would represent the same that we will convey in the sense of a commitment with quality, this idea of a way of showing architecture that goes beyond fashion. It is a selection of architects that have nothing to do with fashion or any other things. It's a selection of the architect in the measure that the work makes it move forward in the field of architecture in general. So I would invite you all to see how this works. And also the work of Carrillo and all his teams. And I hope that you can enjoy. And thank you. Somebody Carrillo de Graça. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. Just a few words of TC Quadernos. I knew by João Luís Carrilho da Graça that this adventure had started many years ago when Ricardo Meri invited me to work with it and to try to bring this to fruition. It seemed very interesting from the start because not all magazines have a specific view on the way that they present the works of architects. And I think that it does happen. Tia Quadernos has this quality of having a view, which is the view, after all, of construction. I heard an interview that João Luís Graça did with Antena 2, saying that if architecture was something, it would be essentially the construction. And it seemed quite interesting because uh, Carrillo de Graça is recognized by the territorial dimension, radical artistic of some projects. And it is common for its work to be presented from any other of these views. But I don't think it is by accident that Carrillo de Graça, in an interview from 04, almost 30 years of career, defined architecture as, and I quote, an artistic possibility always following the reference of construction. So we try to understand that the production is shown specifically from this specific point of view which is, has been something that is not being considered in its work, which is construction. So Carrillo de Graça describes many times the difficulties that he faced as a youngster between his inexperience and also the lack of ability of the, some of the constructors of doing it with perfection. And usually I think that with a sophisticated sense of humor, that we all recognize as is a trait of his, shows this that it has been comforted by the idea of thinking that the most important from a conceptual point of view 
would be to put the works working as if they were real models so that later later they could have been rebuilt or improved in a sense that those problems will then finally be solved also this confrontation with the initial ideas uh, with the uh, side especially some readings from brian brace taylor who tell us about a an important project of le corbusier le cité de refuge from the end of the 20s beginning of the 30s analyzing a work by le corbusier that until the reading of this book for Caril de Grasse was a pivotal reference where he deconstructs the project explaining that it was not effective so there is a set of confrontations in this in, in these years that have allowed Caril de Grasse to understand that construction was something very very important and about which we should all be worried the truth is that this circumstance and others have led Caril de Grasse to come deeper or come closer to this great awareness, especially in his works as the regional center of social security of Porto Alegre. It becomes quite clear the effort by Carrillo de Grasse to try and not to utilize or to utilize uh, the air conditioning the minimum at a time where we would not talk about this at all anticipating the discussion that would then come to happen a bit later in portugal also in terms of the school of communication it is quite remarkable the concern of at a place of the city with a lot of noise to create a building that might create kind of a high square where there is a space that people can enjoy with freedom and with relationship with the sun and with vegetation where we don't feel the noise of cars who are in Segunda Circular, which is a highway that is quite nearby. It's a concern with an issue that is more acoustic. These experiences can actually, what they were doing, were essentially to anticipate a bit their concerns that will then have, with a greater force, I would say, in the 90s, where we would start to explore the possibilities and technological expressions of their time. Actually, in the texts and interviews, Carrillo de Graça always talks about something that has to do with the difficulties of building in Portugal. So, he highlights that it is in Portugal and this is quite remarkable that only one of the projects hereby presented is not built in Portugal. So it is the projects that built Portugal, the ones where he ends up getting a greater experimentation from the point of view of construction on the one hand. On the other, greater proximity, not just in terms of geography, but with people who work in the work site and that allows for that experimentation. Actually, Carrillo de Graça ended up designing a set of works that were quite remarkable from the point of view of construction in general. For example, the Pavilion of Knowledge of Expo 98, the first work in Portugal with such a dimension in clear concrete without seeing with a tectonic um, dissolution in terms of sublimation of the shape, but is also something that it's almost exclusive of engineering. No expansion joints, for example, and also the pedestrian bridges that we see here in this 
uh, publication. There are some projects that are quite a demanding, demanding from the thermal point of view, constituting a great challenge, as for example, data center, where we try to dissipate the heat brought forward by computers that had to be encompassing them by a forced ventilation with a passage of air at high speed, exploring the great difference in temperature existing between the interior and the exterior. But it's also the case of the parking with around 200 seats built beneath Campo de Cebolas, which is here in the exhibition that we can see, where unlike underground structures, there is a wall and then a patio to the north. Some of his projects have a very demanding program from the acoustic point of view. As it happens, the um, Auditorium Theatre of Poitiers, with a system of quadratic diffusion, distributing sound in a homogeneous manner so that they can all get the music simultaneously without losing energy. And in another case, it is a very simple and concise placement of an element as a new building dedicated to the German school of Lisbon or a wall of the square of Praça de Suolas that radically change the acoustic quality of an area moderating noise. So it's solutions that are more complex as the one that the auditory into solutions that are simpler as the simple placement of an element on the right place allow for this acoustic quality that is very very special Carrillo da Graça also showed a huge care in terms of heritage a sensitivity suggesting the constructive autonomy of each season as is the case of a well-known monastery of Flor da Rosa or, as in different cases, such is the recovery and installation of the Museum of the City at the Convent of Jesus. These are two of his more paradigmatic interventions in the heritage in the last few years, where he got not just from spatial qualities, but also constructive qualities of what existed. Carrillo da Graça also has had a great openness in terms of integration in projects of what we will have in the market of materials that, there are, that we have in the region. Not as a rule, not as a standard, but as a departure point. But he has invented new materials, as we can see in this exhibition where about the cruise terminal of Lisbon, understanding that after all, the material that would be in the facade of the building should not have the expected weight or the foundations will not be able to withstand. So, Carril de Gras ended up creating a new material by adding cork to concrete, not removing its structural capacity. That material keeps the structural capacity, but by um, amazingly reducing the weight. I think that a lot, unlike many architects that use systems, if you had the opportunity to experiment as kind of something that's recurrent, for Carril de Gras, each project brings a specific problematic and this happens from a typological point of view but also from the construction point of view and this leads to a diverse premonition if you will it doesn't come just at the end of the project when it is concluded the work of formal conception but also it has many times its principle as a founding principle and even if the tales are different from project to project the truth is that architecture from a certain distance 
we can acknowledge shapes that are always taking their own shape. And although these are sometimes of a huge complexity, when we see the finished work, everything is defined, and I quote, peaceful, calm, and serene. Carrillo de Grasse's works uh, are not to be in front of the spectator as uh, a netting of singular, of uh, constructive virtuality or technological. They are actually where the technological and constructive manner is able to erase its own remnants. So this position grants detail a relevant role although it is under the service of the work. It doesn't seem to be interesting to Guerrero de Graça the technical or building definition but technique as a way that leads to architecture. According to him and I quote we spend our lives designing details, making sure that things are properly done. But although this has a very high percentage of the time of any architect, the main goal of details is to disappear, not having a visual importance, but to be an effective answer to constructive powers. They should allow that stronger essential aspects of architecture are revealed so maybe this is the reason for which until today Carrillo de Graça's work has not been presented as today from the point of view of a constructive and technological performance the truth is that although constructive details and tech resources are matured the intention of Carrillo de Graça was always that, at the end, the signals could disappear discreetly so that the work could be observed in all its glory. So his work seems to have been designed and built without an effort, with the apparent simplicity that we can only reach after a period of maturity. I believe that this Equadernos was a huge pleasure to work on it. Let me thank Guillermo Rubio. Let me also thank Ricardo Meri, coordinator who coordinated this edition. It was in fact a huge pleasure to observe Carrillo de Graça's work from this view, this perspective that I think it is actually the one that this Equadernos is in the core of this Equadernos itself. So I think that this exercise was quite interesting to do it, starting from the work of Carrillo da Graça, because it does encompass this kind of dichotomy that really, apparently, until today, and I think it might justify the fact that there is no publication with this view on it, but that, in fact, it is very, very deserving. Let me thank all the people that have contributed hugely with a great deal of effort and a great sense of mission for the fulfillment of this uh, figure or the number of this uh, Francisco Ferrantes Agaton, Raquel Vicente, João Cruz, João Couvrar. All of them were pivotal in the sense of being able to finally compile all this information and to present João Luis Carrillo Graça's project from this specific point of view, despite showing many projects that have been presented in many other magazines. It's not, as the Spanish say, a refrito, but it is to show this project from a view that's special and of its own. And let me thank José Luis Carrillo de Graça for everything that you have provided us with and the interaction we had. I was talking with Ricardo Meri five years because we had a pandemic in the middle of designing this figure, saying that after all, 
it started many years ago as João Luís could explain. And I would invite João Luís to come on stage to say a few words, please. First and foremost, let me thank the uh, let me thank Guilherme Rubio and Ricardo Meri for this opportunity and invite that has so many years as <laughs> the publishing company that turned 30 today. But we started 20 something years ago, but then we ended up not moving forward with it and only with the tenacity and the excitement of Marta could we finally finish it that I'm very interested in because we always wanted to put a specific focus on the issues of construction It's usually not the way that publications happen, and I think that this time we were able to reach that goal. And I'm very, very happy with it. I want to give it to everyone. It's not easy. And I think that it is connected to a right representation of the work that has been developed because when I got the invite I was working almost 25 years so it's almost 20 years of work thank you all all those who are here and I want to thank you all and for being so nice thank you Let's stop for a small break and then we will have our debate.
Olha! Não, não, tu vais, não. Bom, continuamos então agora. Well, let, let us continue with the debate. Being that the uh, exhibition flashback Guerrilla da Graça uh, presented in the main area of Casa da Arquitetura, as you are fully aware, it's the first exhibition on the retrospective on the work of Guerrilla da Graça, encompassing more than 40 years of career. This allows the visitor to revisit the elaboration of 10 projects. Cruise Terminal of Lisbon, for example. Casa do Fonte Free, also a project from the 80s. These projects are presented in this exhibition via models. I don't think the pointer is working. These projects are in the exhibition by models, designs from Carrillo's uh, collection that recently came to Casa da Arquitetura, to which we, we gather a set of films with the designed works. It is also in these works presented texts, drawings, paintings, sculpture, and films made in other contexts by other authors. Blue, red, yellow, Julian Sarmiento, Ornemain Suprematis, Casimir Malevich, just to name two. These reference coming just not from the private collection of uh, Carrillo de Graça himself, but also museums and private collections, are therefore mm, hereby gathered embodying the uh, pro creative process of Carrillo de Graça. Identifying references is an unfinished, incomplete work, never definite and integral, so it doesn't have the ambition of becoming an absolute reading. It comes from the assumption that we are designing a debate on the work of this architect and that the synchronous presentation of works and certain references might allow comparative readings and great intensity cooperation, some of them strategically calculated, others deliberately unexpected. While the logics of Saveri Moratori will have constituted a point for the implementation of the buildings and for the relationship that they established with the landscape, the Russian vanguard has a departure point that's conceptual, formal for its design that this exhibition tries to reveal, amongst other things, of course, we have the circumstances that led Carrillo da Graça to the fascination by Russian vanguards and also some of this amazing reference via quotes from Carrillo da Graça and books from his personal library but also the presentation of different original items such as Casimir Malevich, Alesinski, kindly and to this exhibition by national and international museums. Here we have one of the greatest experts in contemporary art in Portugal, who knows the work of Carrillo da de Graça, Delfim Sardo, standing next to me, one of the most relevant architecture historians, worldwide known, and Jean-Louis Cohen, an expert in Russian architecture, and we want to revisit this historical period, but always to bring it to the light of our era, assessing how its assumptions are still present. Jean-Louis Cohen made a lot of research focusing on 
architecture in the former Soviet Union during the years after the 1917 revolution and the implementation of social realism between 32 and 34 period where maybe the most radical buildings of the 20th century by a small group of architects with new social objectives in the community true radical treasures as Jean-Louis Cohen calls it in a book View the Lenses of Richard Park talking about this amazing architecture as he told me, uh, and according to his own words, he told me there is maybe a sectary definition of constructivism. I don't know if you could share that definition with us, please. For this uh, flattering uh, introduction, uh, yes, I would say that uh, constructivism is a slippery uh, concept. Uh, they're uh, pre pretty much like the Bauhaus. Let's take the case of the Bauhaus, which is better known. There is the Bauhaus proper, which was a very small school for, of architecture. They trained maybe 120 architects during uh, 14 years. So the reality of the Bauhaus architecture is very modest, but the echo and the, ba the, the, the architecture generated by Bauhaus is much uh, wider. I would, I would say the same thing for constructivism, uh, using an image, a concept of uh, Freud. In uh, the interpretation of dreams, Freud uh, manifest content of a dream, what it seems to be, and the latent content. Uh, uh, the, the latent signification, the, late, the, the latent content. I don't know how this translates probably well into Portuguese. And uh, I think it's the same for Bauhaus or constructivists. There is a, a manifest uh, constructivist, which is uh, maybe rather modest, and I would say limited to the work of a very particular group of, of artists which operated between exactly 1921 and 1928, and a group of architects who followed, led by uh, Alexander Viestin and Moise Ginsberg, and they operated between 24, probably the first manifesto, to 1930. So it's a very modest episode, which doesn't uh, coincide with the Russian avant-garde at large, in which there were other directions. Uh, the much construct the constructivist, in a way, derives, I, mean, let, I won't give a full lecture, but let, let, let's be precise. Uh, constructivist derives from the works, the early works of Tatlin around 1914. And at that time, it can be said that there were two major orientations which would shape the work of the avant-garde in art and partially in architecture. One was Tatlin, uh, the other one was Malevich. Malevich with his, his idea of, of, uh, of suprematism. So the avant-garde is made of these two groups and a sort of uh, rather peculiar go-between who left suprematism, took off from su suprematism, but never landed into constructivist proper. And this was Isitsky. Four reasons. We were talking about it with Delphine. My uh, theory is, is that there were very close connections between, uh, ideologically, bet between Lisitsky and the constructivists, but the, the, the position of leader was already taken by Ginsburg. So he, he didn't want to become number two of constructivism, hence he remained on his Art history is often made through these sort of psychological dimensions. So now, what was constructivism about? Also very, very, uh, I can talk about su suprematism and the search for uh, supreme forms of art, the last form of art, the, the, the black square on white, uh, on, on white ground, the, the white uh, square on white ground. So, uh, uh, and I think that Malevich himself felt the limit, uh, in a way, the, um, at the dead end of his approach when he started moving to three-dimensional works, which are the uh, architectoni, yes. uh, which are so important and were so 
uh, they were revealed. I don't know if you had seen the show at the Pompidou in 79. Uh, no, I had the catalog. You have uh, seen the catalog, yes. <laughs> so uh, the Architectoni were, uh, in a way, came after Lisitsky himself had specialized suprematism with the Prony, saying famously that the Prony uh, were the connecting station between painting and architecture. As for the constructivist in architecture, the theory derives essentially, and here we'll meet uh, architectural issue, the theory uh, derives in particular from <coughs> the, the, uh, uh, a small manifesto published in 1922 by a graphic designer very close to Rochenko, whose name was Alexei Gan, and Gan in his manifesto, which has been, by the way, translated into English recently, um, uh, defines constructivism as the combination of three dimensions. Factura, the way in which objects are made, constructs not built. comes from the world of technology. Uh, an airplane maker, Mr. Tupolev, for instance, was called constructor. So construction has connotations which go into the direction of modern technology and modern technical object. And the third aspect of uh, constructivism is uh, uh, tectonica, which is not the tectonic as we understand it in architecture after Gottfried Zemper and others, not the idea of a building an architecture which is true and which visually uh, transmits its structural uh, component, which is something we see in your, in your work, uh, Jean-Louis. Uh, Tectonica was understood by Gann uh, on the base of Wegener's theory of the tectonic of plaques on the, the surface of the earth i.e. a sort of volcanic phenomenon which he identified with the revolutionary movement of the masses, mm -hmm. the revolutionary te tectonics which would change the world. So, of course, we're no longer uh, aspiring to change the world uh, on not in the same manner. Uh, so I think this has a relative value. And I, one more thing. In architecture, the ma main principles, and here we come closer to your work. Uh, I can return to suprematism a little later, but uh, uh, in, um, in, in architectural constructivism, as defined by uh, Viesnin and uh, Ginsburg, was completely focused on the machine, even more radically than Le Corbusier. It used Le Corbusier uh, forms, forms of Le Corbusier, to the point of uh, uh, being called by uh, Russian critics who were opposed Corbusianism, which was as bad as Trotskyism. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, the main thing was uh, the, mim the mimesis of the machine. And furthermore, for Ginsburg, the mimesis of the factory. In his definition of, of the functional method in architecture, he uh, considered that every type of program, a public building or a residential building, could be compared to a factory after the introduction of Taylorism and Fordism, after the rationalization of movement, in, uh, which was uh, taking place in, in early Soviet factories. So uh, this constructivist by Ginsburg is based on the uh, economy of uh, spaces, economy of surface, but also the uh, mastery of uh, mo motion, of movement inside the buildings. And, um, and it's also based, of course, on uh, legitimized, I would say, by a political discourse, the idea that architect these architectural programs can be the condensers uh, on the way to a new culture and a new life. The term social condenser uh, was one of the key concepts which was forgotten for years, it was redirected uh, in the 1960s by historians such as Anatole Kopp, and then um, captured and used in a completely different manner, <clears throat> according to what I call a creative misreading, which is uh, very frequent among architects, by Rem Kolhas, 
who used the term in a slightly different way and more, uh, I would say, capit capitalist-oriented way, uh, but nonetheless very interesting. So what I see uh, in uh, the work of uh, Jean-Louis Carillo de Grassa uh, is uh, an interest on motion, on circulation, which in which I find uh, not exactly the direct echo, but I, f I find an echo of this preoccupation in, in constructivist architecture. I'm thinking of uh, uh, this uh, uh, presence of many bridges, well, foot bridges proper, uh, uh, like Covilla, but also uh, uh, also the work you've done with the, all the, the access systems of the uh, uh, of the um, cruise, cruise terminal in, in Lisbon. So there's this aspect. And also, uh, if I look closely at the school, how is it called, the School of Management in Lisbon? Uh, of Media uh, Studies. School of, uh, communication. of Communication. Of Communication. Uh, I think in its articulation of a long building with the, its, its horizontal and with a, an orthogonal return, for me, it's a, it's a, a clear echo of uh, of Ginsburg's Nakom Fin communal house. So anyway, I'm very touched also to find myself, in a way, among uh, the sources uh, with a catalog of the exhibition Paris Moscow, where I wrote an essay when I was uh, a boy. <laughs> when I was I in... Have, I have the yeah, yeah, I saw it in the exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there is a point I want to make here which is more general in respect to, to, to your work. And uh, I will... Uh, start from the exhibition. In looking, I, I saw the exhibition with Marta this morning and it's really a very uh, powerful uh, and at, at the same time touching exhibition. I think it's, uh, one understands very well uh, the process. I like the, what I would call the geneal genealogic uh, party, which is uh, uh, totally opposite to the boring uh, uh, biographical exhibition taking the uh, works of the uh, hero when he or she is at school and going to the latest project. I think it's much more, it, it's much more inspiring to look at things the way in which they, they are arranged. And at some point in the middle, we, when we see the architectony from the Pompidou collection, which have a very particular history, by the way, uh, and you models nearby, one has the feeling that Malevich has been inspired by you. <laughs> <laughs> and, I've, uh, and I will make a note on this, uh, on this uh, question. Uh, there is a very interesting French literary theorist. I'm interested, uh, sorry to continue, I hope not to be boring, but uh, I'm interested, uh, very deeply interested in what transpired, what makes architecture, architects think and design. I, I don't like the notion of influence, which as we know is one of the uh, most uh, overused uh, pseudo concepts of art history. I'm more interested in literary phenomena such as trans intertextuality or trans transtextuality, how a text is transformed into another text through a series of processes from direct quotation to parody, plagiarism, uh, transformation, condensation, etc. So I think this is, there is much, much to learn from literary, literary theory uh, in architecture and art in this, and also urban, uh, urban design with this uh, point of view. And what uh, the text, uh, I, uh, one of my favorite texts in this respect is a text by um, a French literary theorist and also psych psychoanalyst called Pierre Bayard, who writes about plagiarism by anticipation. How you can uh, plagiarize works that come after you. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives uh, an example uh, of Nietzsche being plagiarized by Freud, uh, of, of, sorry, Nietzsche plagiarizing plagiarizing Freud, who came later, and by the way, never read Nietzsche, because he worked with the same materials, and uh, it was as if he were interiorizing what Freud would do. Uh, we could say also, sticking with Freud, I don't know why I'm so Freudian today, but uh, uh, talking about Freud, we can also say that uh, Sophocles 
uh, Oedipus uh, uh, plagiarized uh, Freud. And I think that it's really interesting to see things in this slide that uh, there is not, not a one directional process. Uh, influence, after all, flu, flu, fluency is, uh, uh, refers to a river. Uh, influence is an image which uh, connects with the idea of a river flowing from the mountains to the sea and irrigating, uh, irrigating the, pla the plain. And uh, I think that rather that, 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 that this, uh, position, this position of pleasure, this idea of pleasure is by anticipation shows that the river can go backwards uh, into the mountains. <laughs> and I think it's, it's very rich and, and the exhibition helps us to understand lots of things. There are many other aspects which I find interesting. Uh, uh, but maybe I'll have another opportunity to, to speak. I'm interested also in your, <clears throat> yes, this is exactly <clears throat> the book by Cup. Uh, there's also, uh, for instance, the reference in what is an, an architecture uh, always aware of territories at all the scales, not only at the scale of the plot where the building is located, but at the, at the, at the scale of the uh, geography, uh, you insist on the importance of ridges, valleys, and uh, uh, topographic categories, but also broader, broader sites. And here we saw before on the screen this remarkable uh, draw, in, analytical drawing by Saverio Muratori. Uh, I think that your work is also uh, an example of what I've called in, a, uh, in an old text uh, Italophilia, uh, which has been very important for our generation. The idea that uh, they were in Italy remarkable uh, thinkers. From I was more focused on people like uh, Manfredo Tafuri, for instance, but uh, who uh, I, I wouldn't say that Tafuri can have a, an inspiring effect on design since he was always critical, even negative and deconstructing designs in a very, sometimes a very uh, corrosive way. But nonetheless, nonetheless, what, uh, the, if Tafri has taught us anything, it is the significance of uh, the intellectual sources of architecture. And I think that this is something one, one finds even in an exhibition where the ma main medium is the model. Temos aqui Town and Revolution de Denatot Pecol. Well, this period of the avant garde of Russia seems to have been forgotten in the global world for a set of years because, in fact, there are a lot of historians like Besner, Gideon, Zevi, who just lightly touched this crucial stage of the construction of what is today our architecture, if we want to be thorough. This book was only translated to English in 1970, about Kopp, and then there was also a book by Manfredo Tafuri, Francesco D'Alco, Contemporary Architecture, issued in 77. It was the year where the Carrillo da Graça started working, and when I was born. And actually, this uh, closening of Carrillo da Graça to the Russian avant-garde uh, seems to have happened from the uh, supreme art, this uh, direct connection. And Delphine Sardou wrote uh, the essay that will be uh, uh, soon published in the catalog of this exhibition. He wrote, and I quote, we can find a lot of isomorphies between the blueprints of the work of Gerilda Grasse and the paintings from 1915 of Malevich. But the specific relationship of Gerilda Grasse in conceptual terms will be with Litsinski, as Jean-Luc Cohen was saying, with critical to the perspective and the commandment of the brown and abstract art, two of the most important projects of thinking of the 20s on art, on space. Can you explain a bit better, Delphine, this connection of proximity between the work of Carrillo da Graça and these uh, suprematist artists? 
Hello, Marta, Jean-Louis, João Luís. Where should I start? Well, part of my answer, Jean-Louis Cohen already answered in the way that he defined constructivism. I believe that it's tricky to talk about constructivism as a reference of Jean-Louis, although often those intertextuality relationships, they are more in the symbolic view and not the shape or cause and consequence. What happens, My, the, what I find with Lititsky is something that has to do with history itself. Lisitsky, in order to give you a very quick overview, there is a key moment, which is the moment when Lisitsky goes to Vitebsk, invited by Chagall to teach. It is from 1919, Malevich goes to Vitebsk, and he ends up remove Chagall with the agreement of Lacharsky because he thinks that Chagall doesn't have the tone to guide, to drive a school according to the parameters of that time. Vitebs at that time is in the confrontation line between the Red Army and the White Army. It's a place of tension, of great tension. And after Malevich takes care of the school in Vitebsk, which is uh, an experimental school in the true sense of the word, quite uh, uh, remarkable in terms of the agitation and the tectonic, if you will, this trilogy, the trilogy of Constructia, Facture and Tectonica. It's quite symbolic of tectonic of the revolution at that moment. There is an image, a wonderful image, I know one probably, there's more, of the red train one of the three, the red train in Vitebsk, Sergei Eisenstein, and Sergei Eisenstein has a description of the passage of Vitebsk in a text, and he states something that's quite peculiar. The Vitebsk had been transformed into a kind of city completely taken by its suprematist confetti. Because Malevich had an operation of painting the city according with constructivist shapes, similarly to what uh, Henri Salah did a long time after in Tirana, by seeding triangles, squares, circles with primary colors. And there is a picture of the train with Malevich, where a set of people who are being photographed have in their jacket sewn to it a black square on a white background which is kind of an emblem of the square itself and so there is a passage in that movement of the school of Vitebsk between the issue of the plan and the passage to the urban context. I don't think that it's weird to that change the figure of Litsitsky that was taken by Chagall to Vitebsky to Malevich. Litsitsky starts to work in the sense of the, the, the spatialization of the color plan versus the three-dimensional view, and he goes to Berlin in 1920 and he goes to Berlin, he starts developing projects for the public space, although the first drawing we see it back there, it's a bridge from 1919, it's number one, it's the first design. And the balloon space, as the Office for Abstract Art has in common a trade to it, they there is a text by Lecinski that uh, really bases all of this, which is uh, the uh, Exometry for Geometry, that has to do with a mobile spectator. This idea of 
a spectator in movement. It's very important for Lititsky in terms of the individual spectator. And what's interesting to me in this process is that he recovers to the avant-garde a problem that was in art since the identification of the role of the spectator by Diderot. The great innovation brought by Lesetsky is this idea of the spectator that by moving in space, not only has some permeability, but also of traveling to use a movie terminology. And I fully agree with what of Carrillo de Graça, the contact point for the space. So that's why we have horizontal plans, making it that the spectator builds kind of a cinematic of the movement in great travelings brought forward by architecture. There is a relationship. I don't know if there's an influence. I know there's a relation with the work of uh, uh, Lissitz, with works that are in the are in Lissitzky's work, of course. That's where I design a bridge with that version of a point between suprematist and constructivism. And there were two numbers starting in 21, 22, and that is where the marriage between issues that come from suprematism, architectural, from texts by Le Corbusier that were translated of Esprit Nouveau, Stefan Oisburg, within that context we end up having this uh, area that is a, a version of what would be international of constructivism that ends up having a name international constructivism it's a kind of an umbrella where we put artistic and architectural productions that go around Europe being that Lisitsky always has a relationship of understanding constructivism as an object with a space and suprematist with a relation with a plan so it's an object and a plan. And Lisitsky talks about this many times, his duplicity. And Hatz Richter, when he writes about constructivism, does the same bipolar view. There is one other thing that might be said, which is... It is built not just, and I think that the exhibition, l let me compliment the exhibition because I really enjoyed it. And I love the way the flashback movement that the exhibition builds because it repeats a questioning, a questioning about what comes before. Roberto Calas has a book called Nupcias Carmi Harmonia where he systematically repeats the question, what was here before? What was here before? What was here before? So, and this is a metaphor, but it, it in fact corresponds to a different question, which is, what's left? What's left? This possibility, the other possibility, and it's been identified differently. It's identified in connections that are isomorphic with other works, other uh, artistic productions, architectural, theoretical, but it also corresponds to a kind of archaeology or genealogy of the work that will be investigated or researched and this is the manner that has a huge sync with Juan Luis's work it is in a retro perspective manner retro perspective is a term used by Jean Concierge and Catherine Davy in the catalog of the Documenta Dash or Documenta 10 where they put a possibility for the relationship of the artistic creation with the past, where there is a question of up to what point the rupture has any kind of sense, they put a possibility of an escopic vision, which is kind of looking forward to 
looking ahead in the rear view mirror. And I think that's what Jean-Louis' architecture has. That historical information is placed in a prospective manner. So, this connection that the bridge that exists in terms of constructivism or in terms of the figure of Malevich or Lisitsky, it doesn't happen in such a close a manner for a Moses Gimburn. That's not it. Although the first is connected to the other, nor it is more defined in terms of Tatlin. Tatlin in the exhibition note 10 that comes before the first constructivist group from 1921, 010 is from 1915. Tatlin shouts the counter release for the first time. They always come about not in terms of quotes or influence in terms of the retro prospection, that's what I find interesting in the connection, the way that things are built, that I think that it corresponds perfectly in terms of what happens in Guerrilla de Grasse. Um, well, the exhibition and the work establish a bridge, a very strong bridge actually, with everything, because there is a promiscuity between painting, sculpture, uh, film production, architecture, and that all of this began in this period, in this time of the Russian vanguard, specifically where these relationships were quite strong. I would say that today, answering to something that you asked, that I didn't talk about that before, there is a long period of time where the access to Russian sources is much scarcer to what happens starting the principle of the 80s and then 89, where the studies will proliferate. But this issue that you are asking on that crossing, when we see what was the so-called Russian experience, something that happens between the first thing that gathers modern painting and icons by the Aguilev in 1903 and the coming into power of Stalin in 1927, taking on the exhibitions of propaganda, press and etc. by Rothschild and Litsitsky, that uh, Russian experience, it's an experience that's almost an example of the entirety of the 20th century. Sometimes we have the feeling, when you see the art of the second avant-garde or what comes from them, we have the feeling that we are permanent that happened in those years of 03 to 27. Alfred H. Park's uh, journal, he was the first director of MoMA. He made a, a trip to Germany and Russia alongside Philip Johnson. Both of them went there and they... Uh, he, did, he didn't go to Moscow, okay. But Alfred Ward did. And he had a mission of surveying paintings to buy to the future MoMA collection before he was a director of MoMA, but that was his mission. And he has a journal where he writes, and in his journal, at a certain point, he writes that he didn't see any paintings at all, because when he met the artist, the, the quote, and, and this is by heart, something like they showed a, a mixture between design, architecture, photography, and film, but no paintings. <laughs> No paintings, so it's not the dilution of gender, but it, it has to do with the criticism to the disciplines of art made by questions that are very precise in political terms. Some growth, if you will. And is it that Kirill uh, de Grasse can help us? How did Kazimir Malevich or Alisinski how did this works help you to make architecture? How have they designed a conceptual point of department in your projects? 
Very interesting question. I think it's amazing what I have been uh, hearing here. I think it's very interesting, very intense. Maybe I could start by mentioning uh, a sentence that I didn't... Uh, let me say it by heart, by Bruce Nauman where he says that what he truly wants as a creator and he looks at other areas of creation are creators who try to work on the structure of his discipline to change to recognize its limits and it is an idea that uh, i only read it two or three years ago written this manner but I must recognize but that this always was what made me move. So when I started working, even when I was studying, I was very interested in the issue of the territory and history and the way that we build upon a certain territory, looking into it in a way that it's not immutable but quite permanent and stable. And this is a way to look before the experience of a project to see where we are standing, how to see the future. If we have a knowledgeable, a deep knowledge to come at the departure point from a certain freedom. When I started working in 77, more or less, I started to realize there was uh, an extraordinary universe, a very short one, before we were saying that it was 14 years, more or less, but it was an intensive and with a lot more potential than what we were able to fulfill, even if, even if it had a hint of what it could And because I was looking for an idea of building things in the most simple, synthetic manner as possible, this possibility of thinking upon a period seemed to be able to shape and give points to architecture where this issue... I never thought of this thought which is design of cities by Edmund Bacon based on these issues of movement tension attraction that is very interesting but the departing point must be the social concerns giving origin to the possibilities of programs that interact condense the social concern, this kind of radicalism of architecture taken to the extreme by a reflection about structure. And I remember my first interview, it's called Reaching the Structure of Architectural Happenings. And there was this concern of trying to understand how a complex reality can be synthetic, interactive and intense and this universe of the so-called Russian constructivism of supremacy of everything that happened in that short period of time was fascinating and it had the meaning of the future of the future and the possibilities that everything would go along they would be the ones that we would try to encompass in the following years. That was my departure point. Without a very exact distinction about the different ways of historically regarding the Russian constructivism, because what I was interested in was naturally, naturally, an idea not of art in the sense 
in the neoclassical sense that was debated in that time, but in the sense of building new possibilities, new realities, realities of our time, the ones that we can dominate and better understand. At the end of the 70s, beginnings of the 80s, alongside the initial period of uh, João Carrilho de Graça, many architects discovered the avant-garde and uh, Jean-Luc Cohen that was somewhat that why was this approximation of this architect in an international panorama what is the exit that this avant-garde seems to experiencing at that time shall we well i think that there were several reasons to for the identification of the a generation which is well basically our generation maybe colas was born in 44 so he's a little older um, you could you could have mentioned to me also mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Zahadid. It's interesting to see what Zahadid does with Malevich, because what she does with Malevich is, uh, uh, in a way, uh, essentially working with a planar, transforming uh, the three-dimensional architectony into planar structures. Mm -hmm. So I think it's. Is it another creative misreading? But I, I still think it's a misreading because it's a decorative reading of, uh, yes, yes. of suprematism and constructivism. And uh, your reading is very different. Yes. You, you were, were right to insist on the structural dimension. And there is one thing, uh, one operator which I find really interesting in your work, looking at all the models, one, what I find really uh, uh, a sort of permanent uh, operation is a uh, permanent question is how you put a new object on an existing ground how d do these boxes let's say mm -hmm. very often boxes uh, touch the ground uh, through their walls or not, or not. <laughs> they levitate and when they levitate they come closer to the prony of Lisinski they float above the ground sometimes they touch it with little legs Sometimes uh, they don't, uh, or the core of the building touches and the rest doesn't. So I'm really interested in this relationship with, uh, with the ground. I have a building. Your buildings are not like, well, Frank Lloyd Wright used to say the building is not on the ground, it is off the ground. So I don't think, except in some cases, maybe the most archaeological one, they're clearly off the ground and coming out of the ground. In other cases, they, there is a mediation here which I find very, uh, very interesting. And in the line, again, of the experiments of, uh, of Lisinski, let's not forget that Lisinski was trained as an architect. Mm -hmm. And in a, I supervised recently a thesis which will completely uh, re, recast Lisinski's education, in particular, Interestingly, uh, he was uh, trained in Darmstadt by Wiener, who was one of the main theorists of the axonometry, and who taught systematically axonometry, and also um, system, um, patterns in descriptive geometry, which you find literally in the Prony. So it's very interesting to see this German geometric origin of the Prony. And then this question of the ground becomes very important. Just think of uh, Lisitsky's famous skyhooks, horizontal skyscrapers, who are no longer, who are recreating a sort of artificial ground and not simply generating a vertical form. So I think that this is really a, a very fruitful uh, relationship. As for this generation of Kohas, uh, um, uh, many things happen in London. Yeah. Uh, I've written recently a little piece on uh, uh, the way Ken Frampton discovered constructivism and uh, made lots of mistakes, but he should be forgiven because as Delphine was saying, information was so scarce 
people were fantasizing on the base of black and white or very often gray and gray photographs. No one had really seen the works before Paris Moscow in 1979. So in a way, there was a sort of, in addition to what I've called latent and manifest, there was a, an imaginary Russian avant-garde and they related more with this imaginary Russian avant-garde than with the real, which was largely unknown. Now the situation is exactly the opposite. It's an overflow of information, an overflow of dissertations. I don't know how all the, our students who are working on this topic will find jobs because uh, uh, you can't build architectural schools with people only teaching on the Russian avant-garde. Uh, so, uh, but there is a completely different uh, system in which one begins to understand really, for instance, uh, one of the, one of the point, points which emerge now, uh, and I think it has also to do something with your work, which is uh, 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 in which there is a sort of interiorization of the questions of, of spatial, spatial perception. It's the relationship of the Russian avant-garde with uh, German Kunstwissenschaft, with the German art history of the turn of the century. <coughs> they read Wolflin before anyone else, because it was translated to Russian before 1914. They read Voringer's abstraction and empathy before everyone. Yes, it's a term new in our century. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, but the Russians knew that. No one, no one else uh, knew these sources in the, in the realm of architectural design. So they were not only uh, innovative in terms of form, but they had also uh, a really solid uh, theoretical grounding in this question of, in the question of psychology, uh, uh, of uh, the perception of space and, and, and psychology. And this is very, this is something which completely vanished under Stalinism. But it was a main characteristic. And here I find also uh, some parallels uh, that now we are becoming careful with all, all the terms, uh, all the figures of relationship. But I think there, uh, this is another dimension which was completely um, missed or ignored by uh, all the people you mentioned who were simply recycling forms without yes. giving them any real meaning. Kohlhaas was probably the most sophisticated because he was interested in program. Mm -hmm. He was interested in the manipulation of programs. Hence, he looked at some Russian projects way closer, and he was more curious than the others. I remember a personal anecdote. I didn't know who he was. I remember receiving a call by him around 1975. I was I just finished architectural school, but I knew the Russian language and I was going to Moscow intensely to meet with the old guys of the avant-garde. And so I knew them and Kolas called me. He was then a friend of uh, Hubert Damisch, the art historian with whom I would later write my dissertation. And he, Kolas called me, hello, I'm, I'm Rem Kolas. I'm a, I'm a Dutch architect. I'm interested in Russian avant-garde. I know you're going to Moscow. Do you know, would, would you help me to find uh, Leonidov's son who's still alive? I said, yes, of course. So <laughs> it started like that. So he was doing his homework. Yeah. He, he had what I would call uh, um, interpretive fantasy, which is something uh, which is really, mm -hmm. uh, really very, very important for artists. Mm -hmm. He had interpretive fantasy where the others were uh, more into imitation or mm -hmm. into, uh, uh, into, yes, the sort of use of degenerate uh, and reduced representations. Mm -hmm. um, now, turning to Jean-Louis Carilla When uh, Carilla Grassa was in the School of Communication uh, with a project began in 87, you saw, according to what you told me, a documentary by uh, the Portuguese television channel about the Chernobyl disaster. And in the context of preparing this exhibition at the time, I could understand that was in that same year, especially in 87, with Sergienko called The Bell of Chernobyl, 
that uh, was in almost all TVs in the world except for the Soviet Union television. I have an excerpt for you that we can see together. Этот фильм снимался с 28 мая по 26 июня и в начале сентября. Авторы не ставили перед собой задачу показать исчерпывающую картину происшедшего в Чернобыле. Они стремились запечатлеть свидетельство людей, непосредственно причастных к трагедии, уроки которой еще предстоит осознать. We don't have a Russian translator here, sorry. But uh, these were the nuclear reactors of Chernobyl from the 70s. Can you explain why the architecture in this film impressed you? How do you associate it, the way that you told it about your understanding of constructivism? How has it contributed to the design of the School of Communication? Well, this connection that I established, this was just a, how to put this, a call to attention that I was anticipating these possibilities coming from architectons and all images of architecture of that period. What I was interested in was the possibility of, at that project, I was next to a highway and a hill so I have two main elements and I would like to answer on the one hand to the movement to the silence that I wanted to create and the connection with a small hill and to build with solid shapes but with a certain vibration to admit that there is an intervention at different scales in the construction of the building. And that is clear in these images of Chernobyl and especially in the architectons of Malevich and many uh, other examples, which is this opposition, which is an experience that is relatively new, that in a pragmatic manner, which is the opposition between massive volumes and inert and elements that put them vibrating. It was from there on that I started to work on this project. Maybe we could go to representation of the project, of the, um, the models, of designs. When the exhibition brought us close to great dimension of the School of Communication, where we see said that they are behind. We can think, like Jean-Louis Cohen said, that architectons were imitating. But on the other hand, we can clearly understand that your model has, the model itself has as their own models that represent them. Delphine Sardou, in the catalog, talks about an episode where Carrillo da Graça asked the Catarina Baleiras, a Portuguese artist that disappeared too soon in only 37, to execute the swimming pool of Campo Maior. According to Delphine Sardo, and I quote, in an experience that seemed to mimetize the Russian avant-garde. This reference, Juan Luis, is it important for you when we define the projects or is, is, that, is that not aware at all? Unexpected. She's a sculptor that I really enjoy their work. And I asked her to do it because it was working you know, with plaster. And there was a certain proximity for this period of Russian constructivism. But she built it in the basement of the her grandmother's basement in order to see it i would go to the kitchen down the stairs go to the basement and all the elements were not only in newspapers 
of this period, but also around there was a set of abandoned things that created the scenery for what was happening. That model, unfortunately, does not exist anymore, but I really loved it because it was kind of... Uh, saying hello to the past keeping on the representation of architecture but now moving forward to design and drawing is this a, rem a remnant of the russian avant-garde the systematic use of axonometry of alitsinsky for example in terms of projects they proliferate for the exhibition itself and it's always a very specific way that Juan Luis has of representing projects I always give a lot of importance to this issue of representation and I was 25 or 26 in that course of Andre Palladio in Vicenza and professors I will never forget this it, uh, they asked, and I didn't speak Italian almost, and they asked why Palladio never had done perspectives. In the High Renaissance, he was never in a place of having a perspective. And I had a lot of will and of an excitement to answer. I started to answer my colleagues. Each one distracted, uh, was distracted, and they were very careful trying to understand what I was saying. And Palladio worked uh, as... Uh, worked with his father as a stonemason and I started to understand because of the orthogonal shape and the volume that was the way that they were working with an intervention in reality via what was built or via orthogonal designs and I really love that idea because when we have a a design when we address things we are taking on a decision as it serves in terms of a reality which is perfectly valid but I'm a bit I don't know how to put this radical but I was always more interested in the relationship with the territory and whether it was being built at the point of view that they might entail and hardly enough with drones we can have unexpected point of views or airplane that have nothing to do and soon we will be on the air with a point of view that we could program starting on specific paths more or less uh, rehearsed that could be quite seductive and I always want to imagine the building in its rawness connection with the territory more than the point of view that we have on them that's the view of Elitsinsky when she when he uses as a support to axonometry uh, removing the issue from the point of view of the beholder Delphine yes by mistaking the view of a fixed point observer but if if the spectator is in movement then it is encompassed and admitted. And when they see this, is that there is that text uh, of uh, a text from 23, I think it's from 23, where it is quite clear that uh, stance, that point of view, that issue, which is a political issue, um, the spectator. And that, for example, in the character of the abstract of Comte, of the abstract figure of Comte, it's programmatic, right? The spectator, moving forward or going back, has a control on the relationship between what's on the wall and the wall itself, because the chromatism changes. So it's a movement of empowerment of the spectator in a gesture which is ideological, clearly ideological. And that aspect is pivotal. And Lysitsky has a pivotal role. But I would like to bring something else to the table, which is we have been talking about territory 
and the importance that it has understanding the territory for what you do but with a relationship that John Louis always establishes that it was nev not easy for me to understand with Joseph Poys. You talk about Joseph Poys in a set of situations and I find it peculiar because uh, evidently the relationship with Joseph Poys is completely out of any formal relationship that might be established between your work and whatever from the work of Joseph Poys. So thinking about that and when I was writing the text I was thinking about it and all of a sudden there are two things that I would like to bring to your consideration to see your opinion which is it is precisely coming from this idea of the empowerment of the enjoyment of art that the connection with boys comes about in the way that it is important to you an architecture that happens to call it circulation but to in a certain human dimension of circulation the second thing has to do with the way that Boyce talks about an aspect that we have addressed here which is a relationship with the floor or its gravitation that for you is quite important in terms of the relationship with the territory but does not belong to the dimension of rooting it's not part of that universe it belongs to a specific relationship with the place like the project of uh, planting 7,000 oak trees it has to do with cultures that would replace the trees of the transhumans if you will and this idea of a certain transhumans when there is a relationship with the soil but that has nothing to do with the issue of rooting it has nothing to do with a text by Heidegger which is permanently taught in architectural schools conveyed as being a bible almost for architecture students sometimes with consequences that are a bit dangerous I believe I would like to hear your opinion on this connection with boys especially scale I think that you are very sensitive to scale but I would like I would love to hear something about that I don't remember quoting Joseph Boyce. <laughs> Joseph Boyce Joseph Boyce uh, he's an artist more or less mandatory for all of us and has reestablished the relationship between a huge tragedy which is uh, Germany's tragedy and humanity which is us all and that fortunately we were a bit outside of at that moment and I'm uh, very interested in his work but more as an observant or as uh, someone who enjoys it as a learner than to use concepts or the way that it works what might not happen with other artists it is in the relationship that you had it's not an issue of usage that was the way that I realized it not well in terms of uh, the way that I see the territory I really love that idea of not being a, a rooting because what I'm interested in is the understanding, the conceptual understanding and then the interaction with reality many times I thought why is it that most of my projects try not to touch the ground but I don't have an answer yet 
I don't know if you can help me, both of you. Before giving the floor to the audience, I would, uh, I would ask, uh, please. To the parallels, uh, uh, there is a quality to your architecture which uh, is difficult to define. I would, it's it's a category which is proposed by uh, Berlach, a, a Dutch turn of the 20th century architect, who was. Uh, who had an immense, uh, was an immense uh, reference for Mies van der Rohe. Who, Mies van der Rohe always put Berlard uh, uh, on top of his list of uh, preferred architects. There are, we know his little lecture notes when he got the gold medal of the RIBA in London, and he had a couple of names. Uh, Behrens, of course, uh, Palladio, Violet Duc, but Berlard was on top. And the notion of Berlare is the notion of, uh, I don't know if the, tr the English terms work well, it's the notion of repose, the idea of calm stability, the calm stability of a building, a sort of calm, uh, reinsuring presence. And this is something I find in these buildings, which, as we've said, has always an elaborate, sometimes, uh, even mysterious relationship with the ground, they, ha they provide this reposo, this repose, uh, which I think is a major quality of architecture today, in contrast to an architecture of, uh, uh, which generates disturbing and mm -hmm. <laughs> troubling uh, um, perspectives on the world and on, the, on their context. This notion of repose is mm -hmm. important. You, you increase the stability of all these places, which are sometimes historical, sometimes very scattered peripheries, by introducing these uh, uh, buildings with repose. I would love to know if you have any questions, if you have anything you would like to comment. Barbara, Barbara, do you have your... Okay, uh, well, uh, now uh, coming to... Uh, or coming to a recent period, uh, even more recent than Joseph Boyce, I would like to ask Delfin Sardo. He has a lot of knowledge in terms of the artistic preference of Carrillo da Graça. Do you think he comes close to the iteration of Van Gogh? Because the work of Julien Sarmiento, the Jean-Louis, Jean has in uh, the blue, red, yellow in your private collection, although it's a work of a contemporary author, Portuguese contemporary author, it resonates that Russian avant-garde having it as uh, a work that it's pure red, pure yellow, pure yellow from Alexander Rotschenko. Professor of Uktimas. That subject of the relationship of Carrillo da Graça with Julian Sarmiento is something that I almost don't go about in my book. And it has such a complicity that there is not a lot to say to know how they worked. And obviously, I was a friend of Julian, so in this uh, triangle, it's a bit hard to talk about that relationship. What's peculiar is that Julian, in the last few years, he did, he started doing something that Jean Louis understands, which is to bring things, and he didn't, he never did it in a declared manner. He does this every once in a while, but he started to do it in a declared manner to allude directly to artistic works, to specific works that had an echo, a very important relationship. It happened with Mondrian, with Duchamp, with Degas, and with this knot, with this node. And it ended up 
giving place to an intervention of Julian in a project that's in Lisbon near Santa Polonia, hereby represented here. And it has this volumetric three dimensional side of Jean Louis, of Jean Louis, of being a triple homage by Julian. Because, on the one hand, it alludes to Rothschenko, okay, to the three monochromes of Luchenko, we are 1921. And in a certain sense, they were the end of painting. This notion of the monochrome was that painting would reach the end, nothing after it in pictorial terms. It's an idea, a terminal idea, if you will. Nonetheless, there is another allusion to these paintings in a way that's auspicious in terms of the future of painting, which is a painting by Barnett Newman called Who's Afraid of Blue, of Red, Yellow and Blue, which is a reference to this work. But at the same time, it is also a reference to Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf by Joseph Albi. So it means that Julian has one of the ancient playwrights of it's about who the waves of Virginia Woolf so in this in this triptych if you will he shoots in three different directions and that was quite interesting when in this fourth design that uh, Jean Louis challenged him to he not only does it but it has a fourth one, which was white, and that was not in the horizon of references, and it does a linguistic operation, which is an operation of disadjustment in each one of the buildings where these monochromes are on top. The yellow, blue, red, white, they are mixed with a color, which is a reference to Bruce Nolan, because Bruce Nauman, in the past, in the principle of his work, has a self-representing item or a play where he covers his face monochromatically with all the colors plus black. So he reverses it to white and does the kind of double bind connection that Bruce Pine would do. It's a very easy item, but quite complex in the way that it connects us with the horizon of illusions, of differences that are not even quotes. It's uh, uh, like Jean-Luc Cohen was saying, it's intertextuality, a web of intertextuality that obviously only makes sense because it is in the clearness of archi the architectural part of Jean-Louis that allow for this complexity in the picture that Jean-Louis created. In a wait, we are coming to an end. Jean-Louis said that your excitement for architecture has to do with the possibility of it fulfilling a social role. And Russian constructivism, where the idea of the utopia is present to build a man, society, architecture together. A and this is a quote. How do you think that this idea of utopia keeps its existence in our days? I'm fully convinced that it does. Yes. And I would say this in terms of the modern movement when that was at stake. I think that ideas never die. Shapes and languages might change. I was now thinking about the text that I wrote a year ago for a magazine in Mendrisio that has the title of Die Architektur sind wir. 
which is kind of a reference to voice, which is a concept that I really enjoy that has to do with what we have been discussing, which is if architecture is us, it cannot be anything else but us. It needs to welcome us. And now we repeat the question to Jean-Louis Cohen. How do you think that the assumptions of Russian constructivism still are in vigor, in force, in our era, currently? I, think, uh, uh, I see in uh, Russian constructivism, and I would include the all other direct directions of the avant-garde, an, an incredible optimism. And for me, that's where the value lies, not in a particular language, but yeah. the mm -hmm. uh, conviction uh, uh, that architecture can not only bring forward unexpected languages, but can also have a transformative uh, impact. That the, and, and in this respect, I think that the uh, one thing that strikes me, in, and I'll return to the 10 main projects of the exhibition, is in a way your rejection of the concept of typology. Uh, you're not working, you're working outside of the typologies, you're re rethinking mm -hmm. each program, and you're not inscribing your concert halls in the typology of concert halls, although of course you know them and you work around uh, uh, some of uh, the, uh, the experiences, the same with uh, school buildings, the same with uh, buildings in historical in by, for, for all sorts of programs, there is a typological invention, which is for me uh, one as, aspect of uh, uh, one very important aspect of, uh, of the Russian avant-garde at a time in which uh, they, uh, the architecture was not only an instrument in social uh, transformation, but also in itself a metaphor of the transformation which was happening. So it, had a very rich meaning, and I, I see it in your work. I also see in your work, and forgive me for being self-referential, uh, I, I was thinking of the essay I had written in uh, 1995 uh, on critical internationalism as a critique of uh, Ken Frampton's regionalism, which I found uh, very limiting and uh, untrue and unfair to many people, and I, I know that this is the way it was perceived despite the admiration for Frampton in Portugal. And had, uh, uh, I was then in the, in the editorial board of uh, Vittorio Gregotti's Casabella, and he, he liked so much this notion of critical internationalism that he put it as the heading of the entire issue, uh, which propagated it. And I was insisting on a, on a couple of, uh, of points. One was the, what I call the, and you've mentioned it explicitly, a sort of critical uh, continuity with the modern movement, or the modern movements, we know they were plural, uh, from the very beginning. So this is one aspect which I found, import, uh, found important. The other one was the relationship with the city and the territory, which was a, a position shared by an entire group of, of, of architects who were not uh, looking so much as at <coughs> regional criteria, but had, uh, on the contrary, a sort of an understanding of the broader geography. And the third component was the what I called then the internationalization, i.e. I. the ability to look and um, respond to uh, not to your province, your city, your country, but to the world, which is something which appears in your in interests for uh, art. We've not discussed uh, your interests for literature, uh, uh, and uh, we have an exhibition which concludes with uh, uh, the presence of Thomas Bernhardt. So I think that this component also of in, 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 in internationalization and I would say sort of intellectualized, inter, in, I can use, exaggerate a little bit these heavy terms, is something one meets uh, next door. Well, thank you. you. We will finish with this beautiful, 
picture of the uh, swimming pools of Campo Maior. Thank you. Outro dia tive uma, assim, uma espécie de troca de ideias sobre o facto da arquitetura ser ou não uma arte. Eu defendo que não é. A arquitetura existe para resolver, poderíamos dizer, problemas ou programas. Nós aceitamos e precisamos de programas e da interação e da necessidade, senão não, não construímos. Estamos sempre a construir com outras pessoas. Esta exposição partiu de um desafio que foi lançado pela Casa da Arquitetura depois de ter recebido o acervo de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. A intenção aqui é naturalmente a de mostrar o acervo, mas também a de revelar a obra e a personagem de João Luís Carrilho da Graça. Eu penso que o principal desafio deste espaço é efetivamente a dimensão, a escala do espaço. E foi isso que acabou por nos parecer que era o mais interessante. Portanto, é haver uma primeira relação com este espaço, que é de entrar e ter uma leitura global da exposição e depois ter um percurso lento que nos permite ir vendo aquilo que está a ser mostrado. Escolheram-se então 10 projetos, portanto, acabam por haver uma série de, uh, de desenhos, algumas fotografias, uma série de filmes foram uh, realizados especificamente para este fim, pela Catarina Mourão, André Cepedo, Tiago Casanova, etc. Portanto, essa relação entre texto, vídeo, e a palavra é, no fundo, aquilo que introduz as pessoas uh, no universo de cada um dos projetos. Eu sempre gostei imenso de maquetes e de uh, pedir maquetes, quer quando estou a dar aulas, quer no ateliê para, para trabalhar. Percebe-se então que estão aqui maquetes de enormes dimensões, ou seja, quando nós imaginamos que estas maquetes não estavam originalmente numa nave 